I was terribly surprised by the level of positive reception my Bloodborne video received. I had no idea that Bloodborne, and by extension the other games by From Software, had not only such an enthusiastic fan base, but such complex, invigorating lore. Given that my YouTube channel is primarily centered around video game analysis and explanation, I'm sort of kicking myself for not having investigated these games sooner. Then again, as I said in my Bloodborne video, I purposefully avoided From Software games for their difficult learning curve. Not because I dislike difficulty, but because I don't normally have the time to develop the skill needed to play difficult games. Thankfully, over the past month, the events in my life allowed me to play not only Bloodborne, but the Dark Souls series. Over that time, I came to the conclusion that the chief architect of these games, Hidetaka Miyazaki, is a mythological and psychological genius. The reason why these games seem to have an enormous and sometimes overzealous fanbase is because the lore is an interweaving of humanity's archetypal myths. It is clear to me, as I look at the lore for these games, that Miyazaki has a fundamental understanding of the world's great stories and religious traditions. Not only that, he is able to extract the elements of those stories that are so psychologically compelling and weave them into his own narrative. What's interesting to me though is that while there are numerous theories about who characters are and how the worlds of these games function, there is comparatively little questioning about what inspired these narratives. Don't get me wrong, there is some of it, but in my opinion, nowhere near enough. I believe that if we understand where Miyazaki got his inspirations from, the hidden secrets of these games will open themselves to us, and I intend to investigate the those inspirations with this new series of videos. For my first video in this series, I want to discuss a fictional concept known as the World Soul, and how it reflects some of the characters and locations we see in Dark Souls. Like the concept of the Philosopher's Stone, which was the primary focus of my Bloodborne video, the World Soul is also a concept inherent to alchemical and hermetic tradition. In order to explain the World Soul concept, I will start with the location known as the Abyss. The Abyss is the formless, pitch-black void that stretches from Ash Lake, from which the arch trees rise, and upon this tree, the world of Lordran sits. Now, the darkness that permeates the Abyss has a strange, paradoxical power, one that is apparently destructive as well as creative. It is destructive because you cannot enter the Abyss without special equipment or protection. Otherwise, the darkness will destroy not only your physical body, but your spiritual body as well. This is a terrifying reality that we see reflected in the bodies of the Four Kings, as well as Manus, all of whom have been twisted by the forces of darkness. However, it is also creative for the reasons I just listed. The arch trees and the worlds they support are brimming with life, and their roots reach all the way down into the abyss. Not only that, but the power of the abyss is credited with crafting weapons and armor. This paradoxical power might seem strange to many people, but it is a power that is anticipated in the world of alchemy. As I stated in my Bloodborne video, the primary goal of alchemy was to either find or create the Philosopher's Stone, a legendary substance that would grant whoever wields it eternal life. If one were to create the Philosopher's Stone, one would need to follow a very specific process. Some of the ancient alchemists say this process includes 4, 7, 12, or even more steps. What they all share in common is the same starting point. The first step to creating the stone involves a substance known as the Prima Materia. Translated from Latin, it means first matter. To help you understand what the Prima Materia is, I ask you to picture what the universe looked like before it came into existence. I imagine that a lot of you would see a void of nothingness, pure black chaos. In the minds of the Western alchemists, who were heavily inspired by Christianity, that void was the Prima Materia. Before God said, let there be light, and birthed the heavens and the earth, all of creation and all of its opposites were contained within the Prima Materia, inside one 
cosmic seed. It is hard to picture what this state of being looks like, to have the opposites of light and dark, life and death, creative and destructive, united in one seed. It is a concept that transcends human consciousness. The alchemists attempted to illustrate this state of being with what is known as the Ouroboros. I'm sure most of you are familiar with this image, that of the snake eating its own tail. This is the prima materia personified, the creative energy and the destructive energy unified in paradoxical fashion. It is from this starting point that all of creation emerged, and it is from this starting point that the Philosopher's Stone is crafted. This primordial state, this primordial substance, reflects what one sees with the Abyss in Dark Souls, not just with its power to create and corrupt, but also with its personification in the form of a snake. Or rather, snakes. There were two snakes that one can come across in Dark Souls 1. One is Kingseeker Frampt, and the other is Darkstalker Koth. Darkstalker Koth resides in the Abyss, with his body seemingly emerging from that formless void. Though Kingseeker Frampt does not reside in the Abyss, his body also seems to emerge from some sort of formlessness. Both snakes describe themselves as primordial, a state that is shared by the Ouroboros. Moreover, Kingseeker Frampt represents the creative energy, and Darkstalker Koth represents the destructive energy of the Ouroboros. Frampt wishes to see the Age of Fire continue, whereas Darkstalker Koth wishes to destroy the Age of Fire and replace it with the Age of Dark. Allow me to summarize all that I said into two succinct points. 1. The Abyss is the same as Prima Materia. 2. The two snakes and Dark Souls reflect the paradoxical spirit of the Ouroboros, which is the personification of the Prima Materia. These two points are derivatives of the aforementioned world-soul concept. The Prima Materia is, more or less, the world soul. All the contents of the Earth emerged from this first matter, this blackness, and thus, we have a piece of it residing in all of us. That piece can be defined as soul, but it can also be equally or more aptly defined as spirit. The word spirit will become important in a moment, but let us return to the Prima Materia concept and how it birthed the universe. I am about to simplify the Hermetic creation myth to a great extent, so please forgive me if you, the viewer, happen to be a fellow alchemist. In the minds of many Western alchemists, the contents of the universe were birthed when God said, let there be light. When the light acted upon the dark, the contents of the Prima Materia came forth in a certain procession. One of the more canonical interpretations is that the four classical elements came forth in the form of earth, wind, fire, and water. From those four elements came the Tria Prima, or three primes. Those are sulfur, salt, and mercury. It is from the intermingling of the three primes that all the contents of the universe were made. In other words, all aspects of creation had some mixture of sulfur, salt, and mercury. To the alchemists, these three substances corresponded to the human soul, body, and spirit. As a quick side note, I find it interesting that souls are often depicted as fire in the Dark Souls universe, and that the soul corresponds to sulfur, which is often associated with fire. Anyways, for the purposes of this video, I wish to focus on one of the other substances, mercury. Like the world soul, some level of mercury exists in everything. The alchemical adept could extract the mercury from any substance he wished, and use it to create the philosopher's stone. However, in alchemical language, the substance mercury wasn't often called mercury. It was referred to by a different name, Quicksilver. One thing that I completely forgot to point out in my Bloodborne video is the fact that the hunter, like the alchemist, can extract the Quicksilver from his or her blood and use it to create bullets. I'm still kicking myself for not addressing that, but hopefully I can forgive myself by showing how the concept of Mercury slash Quicksilver slash Spirit exists in Dark Souls. I'll repeat what I just said a moment ago. 
the soul, body, and spirit of a human correspond to the alchemical sulfur, salt, and mercury. If the body represents the physical side of a human being, and the soul, the metaphysical side, the spirit is what mediates between the two. It is the glue that holds them together. The soul is the higher immortal part of a human, and the body is the lower mortal part. The spirit is what helps elevate the being from the imperfect world of matter to the perfect world where the soul lives on forever. Think of it like the Holy Spirit from the Christian religion. The Holy Spirit, which supposedly dwells within all human beings, is what connects us to the world of God, and helps guide us back to Him. Again, we see something similar to this in Bloodborne, with the Bergenworth scholars trying to elevate their body and minds to that of gods. Now what's interesting about this concept of the spirit is how our religious ancestors tended to personify it. For example, the alchemists personified the world soul, their god, in the form of Mercurius. Mercurius, like the Prima Materia, had all of creation reside within him. He is often depicted with the heads of the sun and moon, representing all the opposites of creation. He is also depicted as a serpent or dragon with three heads, which symbolize the Tria Prima. Like the Christian Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Mercurius is depicted as the unity of sulfur, salt, and mercury. The heavenly fire slash sulfur slash soul corresponds to the Christian Father. The salt slash body corresponds to the Son, Jesus Christ, who was God incarnated in a human body. And the mercury slash spirit corresponds to the Holy Spirit. Now as for how the alchemists tried to personify the mercury, the spirit, this is where I will blow all of your minds. The alchemists personified mercury as the serpent's mercury, the serpent of Mercurius. The serpent's mercury is a chthonic spirit who dwells in matter, more especially in the bit of original chaos hidden in creation. This of course reflects how the player sees Koth, a chthonic spirit who dwells within the chaos. The snake is also the personified tree newman, hence it is traditionally represented in or coiled around the tree. If the world of Lordran rests on an arch tree, it becomes appropriate to view the primordial serpents, Koth and Fremt, as the tree newman, as the world spirits of the arch tree and of Lordran, subtly trying to keep the world alive or plunge it into darkness. The association between snakes and spirit do not stop with alchemy. There is the Greek god Hermes, known as the messenger god. He was the one who mediated between the humans in the world of matter and the gods in the heavens. In this sense, he is much like the spirit that intermediates between the body and the soul. As some of you already know, the Romans had another name for Hermes, Mercury. To top it all off, Hermes slash Mercury is often seen carrying a caduceus, a wand with two snakes surrounding it. Here's something else to consider. The only snake god that I could find whose name was etymologically close to either Framt or Koth was Nos. Nos was the chief god of the Christian Gnostics known as the Nosens. Nos was seen as an animating spirit who penetrated all living matter in the universe, a function that resembles that of Framt and Koth. There's also the possibility that the name Koth was inspired by Ka from the Jungle Book, but who knows. I understand that some of this might have confused you, so I will now conclude this video with another summary. The whole point of this video was to demonstrate the potential links between Dark Souls and alchemy. The Abyss and Dark Souls parallels the alchemical Prima Materia. Both Abyss and Prima Materia reflect the state of the world before creation. Both are personified by serpents. The Mercury slash spirit that resides within the Prima Materia and all of creation is personified by the alchemists as a serpent. The tendency to personify the spirit as a snake extends to Greek and Roman mythology, Christian Gnosticism, and beyond. As I said before, I think Hidetaka Miyazaki understands these concepts inside out and backwards. He not only understands the history of these myths, 
he not only understands what makes them so psychologically compelling, but he is also able to weave them together into new myths, ones that are roughly as powerful. One only needs to look at the legions of fans who have poured over the lore of these games for the past 15 odd years. Just like the alchemists sought the Philosopher's Stone in the chaotic Prima Materia, the fans continue to find a single, canonical explanation for these games. By continuing to look at what inspired the stories in these games, I believe we may find our eldritch truth. There will be more videos like this, linking the worlds of Dark Souls and Bloodborne to our real-world myths. For now, I would just like to ask all of you to give this video a big fat like, if you liked it of course. Obviously subscribe if you want to see more Dark Souls videos in the future, and special thanks to Brian Martinez, Preeminent Enigma, Pink Panther, Valexius, The Tofu Survivor, Sandshill, and Biltor for looking over the script for this video. And finally, thanks again to Elisa for doing the thumbnail art. If you'd like to see more of her work, click on the link in the description box below. Until next time, just remember to stay yellow.